Hi, welcome to Perceive 2021. Today, we have a distinguished panel of guests with us discussing AI data literacy in the government. Our host is Jacqueline Tame, former acting deputy director of the Jake and currently VP of innovation at Landis. In our panel, we have Alka Patel, former chief of responsible AI at the Jake, Thomas Kenny, Chief Data Officer and Director of AI for U.S. Special Operations Command. Stuart Wagner, Chief Digital Transformation Officer for the Department of the Air Force. And unfortunately, Greg Little uh, cannot be with us as he was called into a sudden meeting, but he was the Deputy Com Comptroller for Enterprise Data and Business Performance in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense. Uh, Jacqueline, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Pablo. Um, thanks to Clarify for putting on this really exciting conference. And thank you, of course, and mostly to my esteemed panelists, my colleagues, my former colleagues, and my friends. Uh, I'm really, really grateful that you guys agreed to be here today and to talk about something that, to Pablo's point, is also very near and dear to my heart and I know to all of yours. Um, so let's just kick it off. I'm going to ask sort of an opening question to each of you, and I'm just looking at you sort of as you appear on my screen. So we'll go Stuart, then Tom, then, then Alka, if that's okay for this first question. I'm really interested in your various perspectives. You've all had really amazing uh, experience and you currently sit in really important roles um, in this space. And I'm interested in how each of you perceives the current state of AI literacy within the Department of Defense. What does it look like from where you're sitting what do you think are sort of some of the biggest challenges, some of the biggest opportunities, but more, you know, mostly, what does it look like? How, how, how well are we doing? Stuart? So I would start uh, by, by deep trying to understand the question and defining AI literacy. I don't know, Jacqueline, if you want to provide that definition or if you want me to. You go ahead, Stuart, start it off for us. Okay. So look, I think, I think there's, there's various... Yeah. There's various <laughs> definitions of AI literacy. And I go back actually to when I first started learning software development. Um, I, I recently uh, separated from the army uh, and I don't really discharged as a consequence of an injury in training. And the first thing I asked myself is like, what am I gonna be doing with my life? And so I, I, I started to explore software development. And what I realized is there was basically at least two tracks within software development. Um, and I started with a veterans boot camp, and they taught me Ruby on Rails. And what I realized as I was learning that is I was learning basically um, how to use somebody else's code to produce an application. But I couldn't understand like the libraries, how they had been built, how Ruby actually functioned. It was all kind of automatic, um, as a language typically used. And, and what I realized is that instead I wanted to become a software engineer. I wanted to understand how those libraries are built. And I kind of describe, I kind of compare this to the difference between a mechanic and mechanical engineering. Somebody works on the car and then somebody designs the car and the two are very different. We can take those components and apply them to AI literacy. And so when I think about AI literacy, the first step to AI literacy is you can read the Wikipedia article. And like you understand generally what it means. It doesn't mean you understand AI. It just means you understand a Wikipedia article about AI. As you go deeper, you know, now, now you might need to actually have experience maybe taking a class and viewing those models. And then increasingly, you actually have worked with that data. And maybe you understand linear algebra and, and have taken multiple machine learning models and you understand graph neural networks and, 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 and all sorts of complex topics within machine learning. So it varies from, I can read an article about this thing and understand its implications to, I'm a PhD research scientist in AI. Um, I think we're very, um, um, we're kind of above the waves right now um, with, at DOD. So maybe we have some folks in a room that can understand um, the Wikipedia article. We don't tend to have very many folks who have experience actually doing it before. And if we do have people who've done it before, oftentimes, if they're government, um, it's not recent, right? And so they don't know the latest libraries, they don't know the latest techniques. From a quantitative perspective, I've also thought about this question. And what I thought about was how I would measure that. And I don't think we are today doing any of this, um, but what I would wanna do with my background in telemetry is, is look at the data. So 
there's a few places I might look to understand AI literacy. Number one is I would go, what's the universe of AI that's being produced? And I might look through code and I might look for specific terms. I might look for specific libraries that are commonly used. How many times are we using PyTorch or TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn in our code? We can look for that. Um, and then I would wanna know who's committing that. Of the software developers working on this within the DoD, how many are actually writing it? How many commits are being performed with it? And then the other thing I would look at, and I thought Greg Little was gonna take this, I guess I'm gonna to have to represent this perspective, is I would look at dashboards. I'd wanna look at all the dashboards that are being produced, because broadly I'll define, I'll, I'll use AI as meaning data science. And so if we're using kind of basically, are we doing quantitative analysis at all? And what is it? I think it's really above the waves right now. Even if we look, if we're looking at the dashboards, we're not really, we're not writing those dashboards. We're not editing those dashboards. Frequently they're produced by contractors. And so we're just kind of using what their outputs are. Um, so unfortunately, my conclusion is that I don't think we are uh, very AI or data literate. Um, and I don't think we're even measuring it. And there are a number of ways we could quantitatively do that, but strapped for resources. I don't think we are today. And I don't think that's even on the roadmap for the future. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, Stuart, I mean, that's a great opening. And I'm going to go to Tom and Aka next to give your, your respective perspectives on this question. But I really love the mechanic versus mechanical engineering sort of comparison. I think that that's a really helpful kind of spectrum to think about. And you're right, AI literacy sort of crosses that entire spectrum. And you have to kind of look at where people are and where they need to be, you know, depending on their roles, depending on what we're trying to do in the department at the given moment or the, or the US government. Tom, from your perspective, both having had quite a significant amount of experience in industry before and now at, at US Special Operations Command, um, what, what do you think? Are, are you kind of aligned with Stuart? Is there a difference from where you sit? I'm very aligned with Stuart in a number of different ways. You know, when we think about the variability of AI literacy across the DOD, we have shining examples of where the power of our ingenuity and the examples of antiquated bureaucratic processes are all over the place that are keeping us from realizing our full potential. You know, the examples of success prove that we can't just assume that the challenge of AI literacy is a DOD issue because it's too new or it's too complicated or we lack vision. There's a lot of vision for the things that we want to do. It's not always as complicated as we think, but it's often so misunderstood that we lack the tools, the processes, and to Stuart's point, the measurements to be able to ensure that we're getting AI literacy and AI generally correct. There's a recent trend has been a bit like a Gartner hype cycle, if you're familiar with those, where we've been enamored with the promise of AI for a few years, and then we've fallen into the trough of disillusionment. You know, AI is very hard. AI can be difficult, but it also can be very empowering across the landscape. It may be harder to implement than many leaders realize, but not necessarily because the algorithms are difficult to build and implement. And this ties back to what Greg probably would have said, it's the reliability of an access to the data that's gonna power the algorithms. So from an AI literacy perspective, that to me is a foundational understanding that AI is not just AI because it's AI, but it's powered by the data that's fed to it. And that's what gives us the output. You know, it's, it's an extraordinarily important trend that I'm seeing today that we're aggressively addressing our data problems so that we can move more quickly into developing AI. But then one of the key challenges in the DOD really is tied with AI literacy, understanding that AI is not a technology. AI is the realization of technologies from the implementation of technology, right? And that's a little bit hard for folks to wrap around. It's one of the reasons why I struggle throughout the DOD when folks say AIML, AIML, it's gonna be AIML, when the reality is machine learning is just one part of artificial intelligence. We can't go out and buy an AI box because we need algorithms and data to deliver AI. That's where the labeling becomes a problem. Understanding that machine learning is the technology that we employ to realize artificial intelligence is one of the foundational AI literacy components that we have. And I'd say here at SOCOM, one of the approaches that we've taken is we understand bottoms up innovation is going to happen and we encourage that to happen. And those are the folks like Stuart that are going out and they're learning Ruby on Rails, they're getting comfortable with coding. Maybe they don't understand necessarily how packages work or how the underlying code works, but they're getting stuff done. 
And then the top-down direction that we can provide from US SOCOM creates the opportunities for those folks to really go out and have some great ideas throughout the enterprise. So from an AI literacy perspective, we're taking a very broad approach to this. Our leaders need to understand what these capabilities can do. Our folks on the ground need to know that it's available for them to be able to use. And then finally, an area that I know Alka is really focused on is how do we ensure what we're building, we're building in an ethical way. And we've got some interesting corollaries and some interesting challenges when we look at other areas of the world that are investing in AI and AI literacy. As we train our AI force with literacy, we're putting a strong emphasis on the ethical application of it. But that's not necessarily the case throughout the rest of the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom. That was such a helpful complementary, but still very different sort of lens, right, to, through which to look at this question. And I love that you just teed up Alka. So without further ado, my friend, please, from your vantage point, um, would love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Jackie. And really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all and especially um, our fellow panelists. Um, and they've all given such good, rich insights, so it's kind of hard to follow that act. But um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of ideas and thoughts that are at the top of mind for me. Um, I will say, first of all, just to reiterate, a lot of what I'm going to say is based on my former role, so I'm not in the capacity of um, uh, Chief Responsible AI at the Jade. So I want to give that perspective. And then the other piece is, um, I think, you know, just for context for this conversation, a lot of what we're probably going to be talking about and a lot of what has already been said, uh, I just want to focus on the fact that this is not just a VOD problem, right? A number of organizations, industry, everyone's sort of facing the same types of issues. I think it's probably compounded at the VOD given the breadth, given the size, given the mission, right? Like all of those other pieces make it a bit more of a challenge. So, so I just want to put that out there. Um, I will say, uh, you know, in, in my time as uh, Chief of Responsible AI, I had a chance to work with a number of areas across the DOD, right? Um, to, to Tom's point, one of the things that um, I was sort of uh, envisioning is and, and promoting and supporting was the top-down leadership, right? And when we think about top-down leadership, it's around coordination. So how do we coordinate around a large organization? And when we looked around at the different services and components of the DOD, what, what I saw, what I personally saw was that a lot of them were jumping into the AI conversation, right? And they need to be, right? Like this is a focus of the department. However, they were perhaps taking their own approaches, right? Or, or because the part, whoever they may have been partnering with, they had a certain um, direction that they may have gone in as it relates to either workforce education or, or other aspects of AI. And so what I found when I was trying to have the responsible AI conversation is that we were all using different language, right? We were all using different language. We all had different uh, maturity levels of understanding, right? To the point that was already made. Uh, I think that Tom had around the variety levels of understanding. So, so it was really hard to talk about, at least for me in some aspects, it was hard for me to talk about responsible AI unless we really understood what AI is. What, what are the challenges that AI as a whole uh, brings to the table? What are the risks associated with it? How does it function? How does it operate? How do we monitor it? Like all of those types of pieces, we really need to have a clear understanding, a collective understanding, a shared understanding around all that before we could really take the conversation to the next level around responsible AI. Now, don't get me wrong. There are areas across the DOD who, who are, are leaning in 110% on this, right? And there are, um, pockets of individuals who have that expertise and talent. And so when we talk about workforce education and training, there is, an, there is an aspect, or sorry, excuse me, when we talk about AI literacy, there's an aspect that focuses on workforce education and training. And how do we think about that? There's also an aspect around talent and how do we sort of use both of those pieces to, to really increase and elevate that AI literacy across the department so that we are all using a common and shared language. So those are sort of my, my initial um, uh, thoughts and, and happy to dive in as, as the conversation progresses. Perfect. I mean, I, I, I just, I love the way in which all of you think about this. They're, they're, they're such complementary schools of thought, but, but you all bring your respective sort of, you know, backgrounds and lenses to this discussion and speaking of lenses and speaking of sort of 
lexicon and language inconsistencies, right? I mean, and I think that this is something that we find not only in the context of AI literacy, but sort of functional literacy across a whole host of different things, whether it's in the Department of Defense or, or other areas, just if you have not sort of solidified that, that foundational level of understanding about what you're talking about and made sure that everybody that's in that conversation knows how you're framing it, knows how you're thinking about it, knows the context in which you're talking about it, you're ripe to talk past one another, which I do think to your point, we've been doing quite a bit of. And I think a lot of people actually, just to kind of you know, tie a bow on this first question, I think a lot of people in my experience, and certainly when I was was in the department and, and, and most recently at the Jake, I saw a lot of people having conversations where I think that they believed they were absolutely on the same page and talking, you know, the exact same way. And in fact, I was sitting there and others were sitting there being like, I don't think that you guys are saying the same thing, <laughs> you know? So, so this is a really, really critical point. So I wonder, and Stuart sort of uh, dove into to this a little bit in, in his initial answer about kind of how, how might you assess, or, or how, sorry, how are we currently assessing, you know, the state of, of AI literacy? And each of you gave a couple sort of, you know, potential indicators. Um, so I, I just want to pull the thread a little bit, Alka, maybe you and Tom and then Stuart, if you have additional thoughts, just kind of based on the other panelists, you know, from, from your respective vantage points, again, how were either you trying to sort of think about how we would assess our, our kind of AI and data literacy or, or how have you seen it done even in other um, areas or industries that might sort of lend themselves to, to tools and techniques that we might employ here, Alka? Sorry, it took me a second to find that mute button or unmute button. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so there's, you know, I think there's some efforts already, frankly, at the DOD, right? So the Jake had issued a, a work, a DOD workforce education um, strategy. And I think, you know, number one, starting with a strategy that everyone can sort of look to as a North Star, I think is really critical. Um, I think what was really uh, important in that strategy was the identification of different archetypes. So when it does come to AI literacy, um, I don't think everyone doesn't need to be a programmer or a developer, right? Or have to understand how to code, but they do need to at least have a baseline understanding of what AI is and how it pertains to them in their functional role. And I think that's really important. So, so what this workforce education strategy does is it has um, a number of different archetypes based on functional role. And I think um, sort of the next step in that journey is saying, all right, what is the standard um, curriculum? And I'm not talking about like very prescriptive, but what are the key um, objectives for each of those functional roles do we need to identify um, as part of their AI literacy learning, right? And then how do we, how do we again, standardize that in the sense that like, regardless of what part of the DOD we're talking about, they're getting the same sort of uh, book or, or playbook in terms of learning that literacy aspect. So I think just from a procedural perspective or organizational perspective, I think that is really important. I think there are ways to also um, ensure that this actually gets executed because it's one thing to have a strategy, but really, you know, the key is in the execution. And I think um, having a frank conversation for any organization in terms of committing resources, right? This takes money. This is going to take a this is going to take money. You may not see your return tomorrow or next month or a year, right? Like this is investment in your people. And so how do we make sure that, you know, from, from a business or an organizational perspective, that the appropriate amount of funds are allocated for making sure that this happens. And then once you've got those funds, you've got the strategy, you've got some standard curriculum, so to speak, based on functional areas, then how are we actually measuring that? Um, that uh, the entire workforce is, is being um, uh, pulled into this and being uh, ha has gone through sort of the training, so to speak, um, the different curriculum aspects. And so I think measuring the number of people who've gone through the training, ensuring that there's continuous training because with AI, with this area, things are developing so quickly that, you know, day two or, or maybe an hour after the actual curriculum has been shared, something has changed. And so there has to be sort of constant vigilance and making sure that um, this ongoing continuous training, and it's, and again, a different mindset when it comes to AI, when it comes to AI literacy, um, and, and really trying to think about um, measuring that aspect. And then also 
there are opportunities where we can think about, you know, credentialing opportunities or certification opportunities. And so thinking about how do we develop those and Defense Acquisition University is a prime example, right? When we think about how we acquire these technologies, um, thinking about who we can partner with across the organization who've already done this. We don't need to recreate the wheel and start from scratch. So how can we partner with them, create sort of certifications as necessary for internal and external partners, and then sort of measuring that to ensure that um, our whole communities are hearing and, and seeing the same thing so that, again, we're speaking that same language to move things forward. Thank you. I love that. Tom, do you have any additional thoughts on kind of the current state of assessing AI literacy? Assessing AI literacy, I think, is hard either in industry, in academia, or government, right? There, there are not a lot of certification programs that are going to tell you explicitly how much data literacy you have. And I, I would compare this to a comment Stuart made earlier about learning software development, you know, going out and getting a certificate in Ruby on Rails. We have a lot of folks that are going out and getting certificates in machine learning, and they're getting certificates in data science. But are they learning what the data is actually doing? Are they learning how the machine learning algorithms are actually learning? Or are they copying and pasting packages and code that they found on GitHub? You know, that, that's one of the real struggles, right? When we look at certifications, it's hard. And I'll relay a story that is a vignette that I think really kind of hones this point of why it's difficult to assess. I had a really interesting conversation with someone a few weeks ago who's a contractor for the DOD. And he reached out to me, asked me a mentorship question about whether it was better to go get certificates or whether it was better to go get a graduate degree in data science. And my response was, long-term, you're gonna have a better foundational understanding, most likely, if you go to a top tier graduate school and get your graduate degree in data science. But certificates can help you get a quick leg up for whatever it is that you're trying to do today. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. And the response back from this individual that I was talking to, who you know is a really, really great person, easy to talk to, smart, said, well, my contracting agency said they'll pay me $20,000 more a year if I go get this, these two or three certificates. And Jackie, to your point earlier, I spent a lot of time in industry. So that for me was kind of a shock, thinking about government contractors going out and getting certificates and why would a government contracting agency pay someone more for certificates? Well, I think we know the answer to that. But in general, what it doesn't, doesn't answer is what are you going to do with those certificates when you're there? So this becomes really, really hard. And, but it's not any different than how do you decide whether or not someone who has an undergraduate degree in computer science can actually code? I mean, how many of us have seen recent graduates show up to the office and we have to teach them how to merge and branch software code because they never learned it in school. Does, does that mean they're not a good software developer? Not necessarily, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're effective right out of the gate either. So that, that's a rather broad example set of things to say that assessing AI literacy is gonna be really, really hard. And if we think about the ruthless prioritization that we have to do inside of the DOD to really get after some of these problems, I don't even know that assessing AI literacy is in the top three of the level of effort that we need to do, right? Encourage education, encourage people to learn wherever they can learn, however they can learn, and accelerate our ability rather than trying to necessarily measure it at first. Let's just build the corpus of understanding across the DOD. And then as we grow and as we mature, then look to those opportunities to more finely assess and refine the way that we're building AI literacy. Okay, so I'm going to pull that thread and Stuart, rather than have you kind of pile on on that answer, I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a hybrid question, if you don't mind, and, and go to you, Stuart, first, and, and then Tom and Aka, if you have additional thoughts. Um, I, I mean, I love, here's, for, for the perceived audience, I would say, one, you're very fortunate to have these three very, you know, distinguished panelists, but the, the thing that I'm the most excited about is the level of candor that we have in this discussion, right? These things do not get better by sort of hand waving and magic fairy dust and 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 you know being not dishonest but a little bit disingenuous about kind of where the state of, of where we are in terms of the state of AI and data literacy and what we need to do about it. And just the fact that now we're having a discussion about is there really a value proposition to assessing 
that level of AI literacy right now, given where we are? And if the answer is no, which it kind of seems to be, and I actually very much agree, kind of given what I've seen, then instead of focusing on that, and that's difficult, right? So I, each of you knows very well, and I, you know, from in a former hat as a, as a congressional staffer, also know when you're justifying budgets to the point that Alka made about, you know, having to resource this in a pretty significant and thoughtful way, when you're when you're filling out your sort of end of year reports, which are mandated either statutorily or by the department leadership or whatever it is, and you sort of have to demonstrate that return on investment through some sort of often quantitative metrics that may or may not be particularly helpful or valid, you know, that's a hard thing to kind of reconcile and also ensure that we're continuing down the right path in this vein. So I guess here's here's my sort of new hybrid follow-on question, Stuart, we can start with you. In, in light of everything that you guys have just said, um, you know, what, it, what is the thing or the, or the next, what is the first or second thing that we should really be thinking about then in terms of not assessing? Um, I think we sort of have a, a, a good enough kind of assessment of where we are roughly or where we're not. Um, but so given that, what, what is the first or second step that we should be taking as a department, as a different government entity to start to really have the impactful, you know, discussions and also training opportunities or, or apprenticeship opportunities or whatever they need to look like to ensure that as much of our workforce as really needs the different levels of capability and literacy are starting to get them as we can. And, and this, you know, I'm, I'm asking a very long winded question, but I think it's because the complexity of how do we, how do we ensure that we're budgeting for and starting down the right paths that are actually going to yield return on investment, financial measurable or otherwise, are, are something that we're able to do and something that we're able to do really thoughtfully in light of all of those sort of reportings that we do have to do and kind of, you know, ensuring that, that we're sort of meeting the mail in that way. Stuart, does that make sense as a question? I think it does. So here's here's what I was thinking about as I was listening to Alka and Tom's uh, answers, um, and I was thinking I was I was I was thinking to myself like about my experience. So I was a software developer at Microsoft um, in industry, where I worked a bit with AI and ML stuff, as well as a lot of telemetry data. Um, I I don't remember a single time being in a room where you know, I don't know, a technical leader, a technical fellow goes, we want to increase your AI literacy. So let's have a conversation about AI literacy and make sure you're getting trained up in AI literacy so that you can read, I guess, AI literacy, if you actually focus on its definition, it would be the ability to read about AI. <laughs> nobody ever had this conversation with me. About, you know, nobody ever did this. What we did is we said, hey, we have a use case and we can apply a heuristic algorithm or we can apply you know, a, a, uh, a, a type of learning algorithm. Um, and AI has three different primary learning algorithms. There's reinforcement, supervised and unsupervised. And I think that this is a unsupervised you know, problem. Do you want to go after it? Or I think this is a supervised problem. Do you want to try a supervised algorithm on it? And if the software developer or the data scientist didn't know the algorithm and went and learned about it, then they went and did it or they went and tried, right? So I think instead of having a conversation, I think that you're, you're chasing a boogeyman. If you wanna become an AI literate organization, you don't talk about becoming an AI literate organization. You just start doing AI stuff, right? I don't know how that translates in government to like, how do you plan? How do you fund? I, I, that's not my expertise. My expertise is just software right, and technical programs. But what I would do is I would want to just do AI stuff and, and I would look for AI problems. The other thing, if the other thing that Microsoft had that's important is we had technical leaders who understood the capability. This is something we haven't touched on yet. So and this is one of the reasons I decided, you know, to, to, to apply for, for an SES um, position was because when I looked around, uh, as I was running, you know, and working on an important technical program, and I was looking at the decision makers who were determining the state of my technical program, they were assessing 
uh, capability or future capability based on technical capabilities that existed. And um, they didn't have the technical expertise, in my opinion, to make those assessments. It's not their fault that they don't have that, but it is, I think, our fault collectively that we don't have technical leaders part of that decision making. And so I apply. I think that we increasingly need to see technical leaders um, in the government at the most senior ranks. We can't say, oh, that's a technical problem. We're going to push it down to GS 15s, right? This is a GS, this is a GS 15 problem, right? That that I don't think that's that works. At large tech companies, you've got technical fellows, distinguished engineers, they go all the way up to the VP level, the highest levels. And they might be an army, like a, literally an army of one with technical capability. We don't really, I think we have senior leader, we have the SL, we have STs, we have SC, some SESs that have software development experience, but we don't really have that in government. And I think that's a problem. Um, so what I would do is one, go after AI things, right? Okay, and like start trying to build AI into tools. I would have, I would set up groups with senior technical leaders who own AI, who own AI process or own basically the requirement and the implementation, kind of like the Jake of, 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 of enabling AI. And I would go around and seek to resource and, and go after AI type problems. Um, but, but I think just saying we want to be AI literate the way you become AI literate is you do AI stuff. Um, and the way you do AI stuff is you learn enough to try. That's my answer. Thanks. I love it. Tom, over to you. So uh, tying into this, it, it really is not just about technology change, but Stuart spot on with organizational change. And organizational change is always difficult. You know, part of my experience in industry has been turning around organizations and helping them realize the art of the possible. Sometimes that requires significant changes in personnel, sometimes in strategy, sometimes in realigning teams and leaders that can have a dramatic and immediate impact on organizations. And part of looking at it that way is building the future we see for ourselves, which requires us to think very differently and embrace the challenge to educate and grow AI literacy in the workforce. But that AI literate workforce, it takes a long time to develop. You know, at SOCOM, we inherently understand this because we know how long it takes, how much time, how many resources to develop a SEAL or a Green Beret or a pararescue or a, a special operations pilot. But these are the best operators in the world. And so we take that same approach that says, you're not going to necessarily get the AI literacy you want simply by being in a position where you're told to go after AI literacy. You know, you're a PEO and you're told, all right, you are now the AI guru, go out and do great things at the GS15 level to Stuart's point. You know, they need the support and love of the folks around them that know this to help them along their way. You know, when we think about what we're doing at SOCOM, Part of the second generation CDO at SOCOM, bringing on someone from industry was to have that skin in the game, right? The academic credentials, the industry credentials, the ability to take the opportunity and make it a reality was a big part of SOCOM's decision to bring me on board as we go forward. But part of this too is we've got to realize that AI literacy is already happening. It's already being developed without formal budgets, without policies, without apprenticeships all across the DOD. We have brilliant people, regardless of their rank or their educational background, are taking it upon themselves to discover what AI brings to the fight. And, and I'll give you one example. Colonel Corey Brunkow at Joint Special Operations Command is a really great American and a really great colonel. And he was tasked with the global analytics platform. What is it? What should it be? Nobody really knew at the start of this, but they knew that this was important. Without a formal education plan, without being boarded for a senior service college degree program or some other formalized training, Corey kind of took it upon himself to learn about analytics and AI and data, software development, cloud computing, all these things that in industry we talk about because they just roll off our tongue so easily because we do it every day. But in the DOD are very, very new concepts. And so you tie that with the empowerment from JSOC CTO, Snehal and Tani, and they built a capability that's fantastic inside of JSOC. 
I mean, this is the kind of bottoms up innovation in AI literacy that we need to encourage. It's not about controlling what it is we're doing with AI. It's about empowering people to do more. So how do we empower the bottoms up innovation and couple that with the top down direction that helps it scale? Because that's the other side of it. You know, AI literacy is great when you're on your MacBook and you're coding out some really cool unsupervised learning mo models and you're learning about ICA and PCA and these are all the really, really cool things. You know, that's the geek outside of you. But then the three star looks at it and says, I don't really care what PCA and ICA is. I don't even understand what that means. What is this doing for my enterprise? So that's where we as leaders and to Stuart's point about getting leaders that have a, a greater than average technical understanding of what we're doing creates the ability to take all of this innovation that's already happening in the DOD, empower those folks to do great things, and then leverage all of our resources together to scale that across the entire enterprise. I mean, that really ties in a lot of the themes that we're talking about here that, you know, if we assess just AI, which I'll say is very different than assessing your investment in AI, you know, assessing AI literacy is very different then we've got a huge opportunity here at the DOD to accelerate where we're going. All right. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with, with both of those responses. Um, Alka, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to sort of um, bend the answer to that question a little bit and ask you to pick up a where, where Tom and Stuart left off, and then we'll kind of do a, a closing question with everybody and closing thoughts. Um, in light of what you know, your your two colleagues just said about the sort of the, the the realities of the of the innovative opportunities that are actually you know building themselves, or the sort of the, the people that are the the breachers, the the disruptors that are taking it upon themselves to just as Stuart says, you know, do AI stuff and and start and and test and fail. You know, in your work um, on responsible AI. How did you try to sort of set an environment, either with your working groups or, or with the people with whom you were working, to in, not necessarily incentivize that behavior, but to sort of identify it, encourage it, bring it out, empower it, to Tom's point, and, and, and how would you sort of recommend that other leaders, technical and otherwise, kind of do that, you know, and, and, and underpin that behavior and ensure that we're actually sort of bringing it more into the fore and, and not penalizing people for taking those types of risks, but really institutionalizing that, that culture of empowerment? Yeah, great question. Um, and there's so much, right? Uh, so I would, I would probably focus on, um, you know, the, the, the effort that I was really trying to build a collaborative and coordinated and inclusive environment, right? Um, again, when, you're, when you've got this large organization like the DOD, how do we ensure that um, we're creating that space for, for the successes like Tom was sharing, right? Like how do we hear from all the different services and let them share their successes and let them share their learning? So I will say the biggest, the mm -hmm. biggest thing that, um, you know, one of my goals at the time was really to create that environment for knowledge sharing. And I can't stress how important knowledge sharing is, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to AI. And especially when you think about how the DOD is structured, right? Um, each of the services have their own processes, their own resources. So they have their own ways of doing things, right? And so if I go back to my initial comment about like we need to have the same language and we need to be coordinated. And I, and, and I didn't really double down on the fact that, you know, if our end goal is interoperability and for, for one service to use another services, products and services, then we have to have some form of coordination. We need to collaborate, we need to knowledge share. And so creating those types of environments, um, and to your point, and, and this was made earlier, I think when Tom and Stuart were talking, it's, it's, and we didn't say it explicitly in the term of incentives, right? But it really, to your point, it is incentives because we are trying to change uh, and modify the existing culture to a new way of thinking and a new culture. And so those incentive, incentives, whether it be by processes um, of, of um, uh, you know, um, escalating and elevating in different ways than, than previously, whether it be in terms of, you know, I know we did not definitely go there, but like sort of in my mind, you know, are there just a thought, are there thoughts to incentivize your performance, right? And, and make it part of performance plans of you are going to do X, Y, Z and, and ensure as leaders, certain things are going to happen 
for your teams and ensure that they've they've learned certain things and that they are when we're working cross functionally that they have the appropriate skills and can and are and and the right skills are at the table at the right moments when important critical decisions are being made right and are we measuring sort of those outcomes right so just real quick and I know we're probably coming up on time soon but real quick Aster and Tom were talking I was jotting down on my notepad here we've all seen that iceberg diagram right where you see you know your end goal at the top and it's all that stuff at the bottom right so fine stick AI literacy up at the top but that's not that's the outcome right and it's all that work underneath that ice that has to happen and I think you know when we when we think about it at the DOD that is where the attention should be should, should be put in terms of not only substantively what do we need to do but resource wise people wise process wise incentive wise and then all of that underneath all that hard work is is, is what sort of goes to that ai literacy piece that we get what that we see at the end and so it's the outcomes what do we need to do to get the outcomes that we're really trying to 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 see at the end of the day yeah, I love that. And I, you know, I totally agree with you. I think that when you are trying to change a massive organization's behavior that has been sort of static for a long time, or even the cultural pro proclivities around data and emerging technologies, oftentimes you do have to put some incentives into place, um, whether they be to your point at the sort of leadership performance level on behalf of their teams, which I like, I like that idea. Um, or at the individual level, although ironically to Tom and Stuart's sort of, you know, examples that they've brought up throughout the course of this conversation, I think we have a lot more of the, you know, not needing to incentivize at the individual level. And I think it's more potentially incentivizing at the leadership level to encourage that behavior and reward that behavior. Um, so do, just mind, the do you mind if I jump in really quick, Jacqueline? No, I wanted to sure. respond to a point Alka made, which Absolutely. I thought was a good one, which is, and I want to kind of like more precisely clarified. And I think Tom brought this point up with Corey Brunko's, uh, Brunkow's uh, program that, that was created from the ground up. Um, so in my experience, so here's something I think we do really poorly and because I think everybody's really um, interested in what they own or owning, owning the thing that's been created in their space. And so at, at like Microsoft, in my experience, if I created a new technology or a new piece of software and somebody else wanted to let and it was good and somebody else wanted to leverage it let me tell you what didn't happen what didn't happen is a senior leader said oh that that technology is interesting and is in my space and suddenly now i own it okay that 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 did not encourage innovation in any way what did happen is they said wow you're the technical leader now in this new application and we want to leverage it. Let's communicate peer to peer to figure out how we can do that. Let's bring in other teams that might want to leverage it and create some sort of working group where we've got technical leaders all agreeing to an interface or an API or a, or, or a data schema or what have you, right? But what didn't happen, what, what I never saw happen for successful technical programs is somebody from outside that organization who says, no, 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 now I own this. Now, and, and this happens, it's like shocking. This happens all the time at DOD. And I think it's really um, pernicious. I think it's actually quite dangerous to, to encouraging AI. So I don't know how we like specifically designate certain groups of people who are supposed to be the enablers of AI, but we need to actually stop them from doing what I just said, because it's, um, I think it's hurting our ability to keep talent. It's hurting the incentives to innovate and to build new things. And it's gotta be part of that conversation. So when somebody becomes more AI literate and somebody is less AI literate, the less AI literate person cannot be the winner and determine what happens with that technology. That can't happen, that, that should never happen over. Thank you, Stuart. I could not agree more. Uh, I think everybody on this uh, panel has seen the type of behavior that Stuart has uh, just spoken about. And I would say it's, you know, just to, to reinforce this point, we, we are getting in our own way in this area. 
Um, this is not an adversary. This is not an external actor. This is our own, you know, poor cultural proclivities towards saying things like data ownership. I, who owns data? I mean, data should be, right? I mean, for the entirety of the department or the organization or whatever else, it should be the US government's data or the Department of Defense's data, not a program element's data or, or, or something like that. Just, just the lexicon to Alka's original point about how we talk about these things, I think really matters. Um, so wrapping up closing thoughts, thank you all so much for, for being on and for your candor. Um, I think the, the last question that I really am very interested in, in ensuring we get some short answers to, and we'll just go down the line, Alka, Tom, and then and with Stuart. Um, from an acquisition perspective, from an acquisition professional's perspective, and I was gonna I was gonna ask Greg this one um, if he'd been able to join us as well, but these are the people, the acquisition professionals in our community are the ones that need to really, in my opinion, be able to. Um, write requirements about the, the, the things that we need as a department that we need to be able to buy. They need to be able to help evaluate the capabilities that are coming in, you know, off of RFIs and RFPs. So in terms of that community, um, are there any sort of significant things that you all believe that we should be doing or that you know we are doing to enhance the acquisition workforces, for lack of a better term, AI literacy and data literacy, so that they can help us acquire, procure better solutions, better, you know, company partners, et cetera. And then the follow on to that is just briefly, are there other, is there one other community that you would say that we really need to work with at that same sort of um, strong level now or sooner, um, you know, acquisition professionals and who else is it, you know, the leader, the, the sort of senior leadership level, is it HR professionals kind of what, what is your thought about another community that you think it's really important to kind of get into this discussion and these teachings? So Alka, I'll start with you. Great, thanks Jackie. Um, so let me start with the acquisition piece. So um, I know there are efforts that are ongoing right now within the DOD around um, upskilling uh, around, uh, for, for AI literacy, right? So there's a digital DNA project that's, that, that's, that's uh, being piloted. There's efforts to defense acquisition university that are being piloted. Um, and I will say that is a critical, a critical, critical community, right? When you think about where we are getting our technology, we are acquiring, right to Stuart's point, we are acquiring it. So the people who are writing those requirements, assessing, doing the source um, vendor selection, uh, and so forth. They need to know what to look for, and I think that is that is definitely a gap that needs to be uh, resolved uh, in in a number of different ways. So I think DAU can play a significant role. I think it needs to play a bigger role. It needs to be scaled. It needs to be consistent across the entire DoD, so that we are acquiring technologies consistently across the DoD with the same requirements. Um, because again, I, I can't emphasize the interoperability piece enough. Um, so uh, just in the essence of time, I'll leave it at that. In terms of another community. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna say two communities. One is um, I know, sorry guys. Uh, one is the leadership, senior leadership, and the other is uh, policymakers. So I say senior leadership because they are the decision makers, right? If the decision makers don't understand how to issue spot, for example, or or at least understand at a high level how what where the risks and challenges and opportunities are then then nothing else underneath matters, right? So I think the leaders need to have at least, again, not to be programmers or coders, but at least have a, the right understanding. And if they don't, um, then pull in the right people, right? So to Stuart's point, pull in a technologist, pull in you know whoever needs to be at that table. So I think leadership needs to understand and see where their blind spots are as it relates to this and then fill that gap. The other is policymaker makers, and and again, I think you, we are seeing a lot of policymakers who are moving in this direction and are understanding and and getting up to speed on AI, and I think that's wonderful. How do we do that consistently? And again, how do we do that in a coordinated fashion? So so instead of taking piecemeal approaches, how do we look at this holistically in terms of the policy that they might be putting forward as it relates to AI? So I'll start there. Thank you so much, Tom. Over to you. So part of what Alka said, you'll certainly hear from me, uh, maybe also from Stuart. When I think about acquisition in particular, there are a lot of great examples where we have struggled to 
write the right type of contracts, hire the right types of folks. You know, SOCOM has spent a great deal of time working to educate our force on AI as well. We developed two training programs, one with Carnegie Mellon University and one with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that really brought the understanding of AI concepts, potential, and even a little bit about the specific technologies to our acquisition leaders, as well as our other senior leaders, so they could really start envisioning the art of the possible. Because at the end of the day, we must have AI literate leaders, not AI coding leaders, but literate ones, especially in acquisition that have more than a cursory understanding of how this all works together why data is so important, ensuring contracts are written that derivative data is also owned by the DOD, examples of where machine learning can be applied, how they can look to improve some of the contracting that they do with AI as well. I mean, there's massive interest in companies that can take all of the unstructured data that we have in all of the contracts that we've written and generate capabilities from that history that then improves our acquisition processes in the future. But back to leadership, just look at how Dr. Hicks, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, she doesn't need a degree in AI to understand how important it is or to have a high level of AI literacy that she can code. She just needs to understand it enough to move out and disrupt the status quo so that we can collectively do great things for the DOD. You know, her creating data advantage memo, I think has done more for people who are in CDO, CTO, CIO positions than has been done for many, many years, because it really puts a stake in the ground that says, this is important and we're gonna get after it. But I'd also say that one of the biggest supporters for the DOD to an AI enabled future needs to be in the Congress. This is where our professional staffers, you know, your friends, Jackie, they're some of the hardest working, intelligent and most effective people we have in our society. For them to truly understand AI and its potential, they can help ensure that we keep America aligned with our federal and our DOD policies, aligning data and AI with supporting technologies. And all of this is gonna have a dramatic effect on the success or the failure of the DOD and for America. Now there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the Congress to ensure we maintain control and enable our AI future and strategic advantage. These aren't mutually exclusive, but partnering with those leaders is gonna be absolutely essential for us to be successful. So well said. Thank you so much. Stuart, you want to wrap us up? Sure. Um, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with Tom's comments. Uh, the, only, the only addition or suggestion I would have from an acquisition perspective. So what I've, I've, I've spoken to some acquisition professionals uh, since I've come to the Air Force. Um, one of the challenges, as Tom noted, is that we don't have access to the derivative data or the telemetry data coming off, for example, things like certain parts of weapon systems or other things. Um, we're, we're, in the case of the Air Force, in some cases, uh, we're trying to change this, but we're actually recording that data and then taking it off of a potential system and just dropping it on the floor. We're not using it for anything, right? And, 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 and I, I think that probably this happened because nobody, who was writing that contract, who knew what was, who, who may or may not have even known that data was being recorded, considered what you could do downstream with that data. And I don't think that's just an AI literacy problem. I think it's a technical problem. I think it's actually just technical knowledge, right? It doesn't take understanding a deep learning neural net to understand that if there's data coming off of a, of a potential system, that that data could be leverageable in some way to answer some sort of question. So. What I would do, like what I think of, uh, what, what I would look for in an acquisitions professional, as, as noted also, the need for coding, they don't need to be able to code. What you're basically looking for is the skill set of a technical PM at a, at a, at a um, software company, a technical product manager, a technical program manager. That's the level of sophistication. They typically, or they may have a computer science background, but they don't have to. And so what I would want to do is basically create some sort of exchange with them. So there's a couple of ways you could do that. I came in actually to the DOD through something called civic leave at Microsoft, which allowed me to actually take some time while holding my position uh, and providing actually some very generous um, compensation that helped actually bring me up um, when I came to the government. Um, and, and, and it was able to work for a year and a half while on that leave program. And I know, I believe Google has it, other technical companies have it. So Number one, I think we should be leveraging this offering 
more carefully. We should be more thoughtful about this. So industry wants to send people to government and then have them come back. I think that's great. We should do that. We should get these types of people. I think we also need to find a way to get, I know that there's fellowships in the Air Force and through Defense Ventures and others to go and send people to VC. We should be sending people to tech companies. We should be sending our acquisition professionals to go work at a tech company for a year and come back. And I think that those are, those are some ways where potentially we could increase your literacy uh, and, 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 and improve the way we think about technical decisions, which I think is really what this gets at. Absolutely. I, I can't agree enough. Um, I, I love the idea of sending specifically acquisition professionals to, to some of those companies to sort of do a tour. I love that very much. All things that we can explore, all things that I know are under consideration in some pockets, but things that we really sort of collectively need to focus on, I think, uh, more robustly and more thoughtfully. So um, I can't tell you again how appreciative I am of each of your taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today for the panel. Um, and, and thank you for all that each of you are doing, have done, continue to do for, for AI and for national security. It means very much to me, and I know it means uh, a lot to everybody who's watching this panel. So thank you so much. Pablo, back over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us on our virtual stage today. It was a pleasure to learn about AI data literacy in the government, uh, both today and into the future. And uh, well, a bigger round of applause from our virtual audience for you guys. <laughs> and we will see you at our next session. Thank you very much.